Barretts, who is D-Wave's CEO. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So obviously there has been this huge upsurge in interest in and knowledge about quantum, although I think we're all still learning quite a bit about it. What do you think of all of these sort of competing timelines, especially when you guys are already making these machines? Making them and we have customers using them today as part of their business operations, so we're truly commercial. There are a number of different approaches to developing quantum computers. Some of them will take longer to mature, some of them uh, nearer term, at D-Wave, we provide what's called annealing quantum computers, mm -hmm. and those are commercial today with companies like NTT Docomo or uh, Ford Autoson or Patterson Food Group all using us today to help benefit their businesses. So for people who are interested in investing in something like quantum computing, what is the use case today for the computers that you're selling versus the next step and the step after that and the step after that? Yeah. So um, I think about it in three phases, near term, medium term, long term. Mm -hmm. In the near term, there are a broad array of problems that we uh, typically think of as business optimization problems. This can be anything from workforce scheduling to manufacturing plant floor optimization, even protein folding. And these problems can be addressed today with D-Wave's annealing quantum computers. And so the companies that I mentioned a minute ago are all using for business optimization. In the medium term, I think that quantum is going to make a significant impact on AI and machine learning. Specifically, quantum computers are very fast and very energy efficient. And what this means is that all this rhetoric around AI requiring nuclear power plants and massive energy generation stations is likely not going to be required to anywhere near that level once quantum computers are a part of the training process. But when is that? I think that we may be able to get there within a year or two. Really? We're not, this is medium term. We're not talking about long term. In fact, at D-Wave, we announced uh, a few days ago a first step toward this by introducing an AI machine learning platform that uh, developers can use to start investigating how to use quantum for large language model training. But we still have a ways to go mm -hmm. on developing that technology and bringing a complete product to market. And then longer term, we're talking about uh, you know, almost unimaginable things like designer drugs, where we could develop a drug that would address just your specific set of ailments. Um, so you know, for people who are investing in stocks like yours and others, you know, obviously you've seen crazy gains in the stock that are, are exponential. What do you think is still um, sort of the biggest misconception or what do you, what kind of education do you have to do for investors and potential investors? Well, there are quite a few different quantum computing companies that are pursuing different approaches to developing their systems. And so I think you really need to take a look at which of these companies are talking about delivering products five or 10 years from now, and which of them are delivering products in the near term. I'm very proud of the fact that we are delivering products today that are creating value. And so I think that that's a really good place to start. But there is huge long-term opportunity as well. Um, and I, I should mention the opportunity today. You guys have been growing a lot, but you're still relatively small in terms of the revenue that you bring through the door. And so how quickly do you expect that to ramp up? At some point, is there sort of a tipping point? Yeah. So there are two components to our business model. One is a service-based component, what we call quantum compute as a service. And for commercial companies that really just care about leveraging quantum to get better solutions to their applications, quantum compute as a service is the ideal model. But it takes time to build a revenue base around that because it's a service-based business. It's a recurring revenue business goodness more predictable revenue growth in the long term, but it takes time to build that base of revenue. We also sell systems. Now, we just started selling systems only about six months ago. We sold our first system to the Ulich Supercomputing Center in Germany. Um, that is a very complementary model because it's A, to supercomputing centers, government labs, so not necessarily so more commercial. Research -based. More research-based. More mm research-based, -hmm. but it's near-term revenue recognition. As soon as we install and Got deliver it. the system, we recognize revenue up front. So I think the two will work together very well to allow us to build both near-term revenue revenue more rapidly, as well as that base of uh, longer-term recurring revenue. Now, I, I know you guys have um, 
you don't yet haven't made a lot of acquisitions, but you're thinking about thinking about how you want to make acquisitions. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but what, where are you kind of in that process, yeah. and what would be complementary for you guys? So over the course of the last six months, we were uh, fortunate enough to be able to raise a fair amount of cash uh, through at the uh, market transactions, and, and we thank all our shareholders, and we work every day to try to make them um, proud of D-Wave and, and comfortable with their investment. But we now have over $800 million in the bank, and that's well more than we need to achieve profitability, we believe, um, based on our normal uh, course of business. So we are now looking at trying to accelerate growth through acquisitions. We haven't talked about what the acquisition strategy is. We've been working on it for the last few months. Um, I hope to be able to announce something in, in the near future, but we're very excited to now have the opportunity to pursue that. All right, well obviously we'll stay in touch on that. And lastly, I wanted to sort of zoom back out. And I, I'm curious about the competition between the US and China. Um, we've obviously seen it in AI. How is that playing out in quantum computing? And is there a risk that we see you know, them outpacing us as they have tried to do in some other technologies? Uh, there's absolutely a risk. So China is by far investing more in quantum than any other country. Um, they're leading at about 17 billion. Uh, if we take Europe, the EU, uh, all of those countries together, it's about 11 billion, and the US is at about 5 billion. Mm. So we are behind China significantly. In fact, you know, all the countries in the world are well behind China. So I do think it's important for the US to really start focusing on a better strategy for quantum and really to up that investment. Have you gotten, heard any glimmers of that from Washington? There's obviously been a lot of focus on AI there, but what about quantum? Yeah, I, I mean, look, the, the premier funding mechanism for quantum in the U.S. is called the National Quantum Initiative, uh, and that was put into place under the initial Trump uh, administration. It was supposed to be renewed under Biden. It never got renewed. It, it still hasn't been renewed. Mm. So we really need to get focused on getting that renewed, getting the right programs in place, and making sure that the U.S. is the leader in quantum computing. Regetti Computing posting earnings results for the second quarter on Tuesday. Its stock has been on a tear over the past 12 months, up more than 1,800% as excitement over quantum computing space continues to build. Here to break down the report, we got Rigetti Computing CEO, Sabod Kalkarni. Sabod, always great to see you, sir. Let's, let's start right with this earnings print, Sabod. You reported the stock finished up today about 6% in today's trade. Walk us through the print, Sabod. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, we had an exciting quarter, uh, but more than the financial numbers, uh, quantum computing is all about technology development right now and technology milestones. So the run-up in stock price as well as the movement today, I believe is more to do, has more to do with our technology milestone demonstration than the actual sales and bottom line number and comparison with estimates. Essentially what we announced three weeks ago and reinforced that announcement yesterday is that we have deployed our latest system on cloud that has four chiplets of nine qubit each. So total 36 qubits with a, what we call fidelity, two qubit gate fidelity of 99.5%. That's the biggest quantum computer using chiplets at a very high fidelity right now, uh, state of the art. And that's what you see the reaction right now. Uh, it, I don't believe it has anything to do with the financial numbers. It's a huge technology milestone to get chiplets demonstrated at that fidelity because fundamentally it gives you a viable scaling path towards thousands of qubits, which is really what you want in the long term. So hopefully that, that uh, that's the reason why the stock has done what it has. I, I do want to get to the technology, Sabote. Just one more question, though, for, for investors listening. What is your, what does the cash and burn rate look like right now, Sabote, at the business? Sure. So at the end of last quarter, we had about five hundred and seventy-two million dollars cash, no debt, and our burn rate right now at the current sales uh, rate is about sixty million dollars a year. So we have plenty of cash to advance our technology roadmap and get products commercialized and get ourselves to profitability in the long run. For the uninitiated abode, um, I'm curious, how would you characterize, how would you explain the advantages of quantum computing, Sabod, over traditional computing? What, what does it unlock? What are the problems it solves for? So fundamentally, quantum computing does things very differently than classical computing that we are all used to. 
quantum computing, we use multiple states at the same time, and that gives us an exponentially higher computing capability compared to classical computing. Also, at the same time, it consumes fractionally lower power compared to classical computing. So we get uh, incredible, incredibly powerful computer, like million or billion times more powerful than classical computer at a fraction of the energy consumption of classical computers. And you know, right now, there's a huge issue with power consumption related to GPUs. So quantum computing has this dual advantage of higher computing power at an extremely low energy consumption. Uh, there are many, many kinds of problems that cannot be solved with classical computing, like weather forecasting, drug discovery. Encryption is a big one that's getting a lot of attention. Or fundamentally, our entire encryption system right now is based on the fact that classical computers cannot separate out prime factors. With quantum computers, you can do that easily, which means you can easily break any encryption core, but it also means to come up with clever encryption schemes, you need a quantum computer. So this whole area with quantum computing of post-quantum cryptography and what quantum computers can do with encryption, as well as many classes of problems, is getting a lot of attention. Clearly, there's national security at stake here, given the stakes involved. That's the excitement about quantum computing. Uh, the, th there are many studies done. There are many numbers that are going floating around uh, from McKinsey, BGC, and other, other uh, agencies. Typically, you see numbers in the neighborhood of a couple billion dollars market size about four to five years from now, an inflection point somewhere in the four to five years uh, from now, which we call quantum advantage. And that's when the sales trajectory takes off to 10x of those numbers in about five to 10 years after that. So we're talking of a market that's hundred of billions of dollars a decade or two from now. But right now, we are clearly in the R&D stage. We clearly need to perfect the technology to get to that big milestone in about four years, which we call quantum advantage, which is essentially when you can take a quantum computer and take on almost any application that your classical computer does, but does it in a superior way. I was talking to an analyst today, Sabode, and I guess he was kind of, he was leading to where you were just going there in terms of milestones ahead, because his point was, he said, listen, I, I think what investors want to know from Sabote is how quickly he can scale up to 100 qubits and then 1,000. You know, because it's sort of like an LLM trying to, you know, doing the work, you know, mm -hmm. one GPU versus a data center. What's your answer to that? So sure, there are, what we have said is there are four things we need to do to get to quantum advantage, which is when quantum computers can really proliferate in data center and start doing practical applications as well as solving some really difficult, challenging problems. And those four things are we need a minimum of 1,000 qubits. We need a minimum of 99.9% .9 two qubit gate fidelity. We need a maximum of 50 nanosecond gate speed. And we need real-time error correction. Assuming we do those four things, we believe we will be able to demonstrate quantum advantage. And, and that's where business really takes off. Now, all of those things are challenging by itself. The most important one, we believe, is the fidelity one. That's really the most challenging one. This chiplet demonstration we did yesterday, and that's why it got a lot of excitement going, is a clear way to address the qubit count uh, challenge that we have. The chiplets, which are used in semiconductor industry all the time, we see a relatively easy path. I don't want to say easy, nothing is, nothing is easy in quantum computing, but a relatively easy path to scale up the qubit count to 1,000 qubits from where we are right now. Fidelity, we are at 99.5% today. We need to get to 99.9%. .9%. That is probably the most daunting challenge we have ahead of ourselves. Getting the gate speeds, we are already at 60 to 70 nanoseconds, faster than 50 nanoseconds. That should not be a big challenge, particularly for the modality we use, which is called superconducting gate-based modality, where gate speeds are intrinsically very fast. Some other modalities like trapped ion and pure atoms, they have a big challenge where they are more than a thousand times slower than superconducting gate-based modality. But for us, in with superconducting gate modality, that's not a challenge. And real-time error correction is what we use in our classical computers right now. There are many different ways of doing error correction. Uh, but we obviously need that to address the last few errors that are left in the system. So we will obviously push to get these four things uh, under control ASAP. Our realistic timeline says we are at least three to five years away from that milestone right now. So that's why we are using a number four. Obviously, if everything works in our favor, we may be talking three, but we are talking technology development. Things may not work exactly as planned, and it may be five years. So that's why we are using a median number of four to get to quantum advantage. Sabo, always good to see you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Josh.